Hello everyone, you are watching Jesus the Christ. Some of you might think that this video is about proving that Jesus is the Christ. That's not what it's about, though you could get that idea from the title. I'll explain the purpose of this video in a second. Some say Jesus was just a good person. Some say Jesus was a prophet. Some say Jesus was a magician, and some say Jesus is the Christ. Depending on who you ask, you'll receive a different answer. In this video, I want to simply expound on the name Jesus Christ and on the title Christ. I hope that by doing so, you will get a clearer picture of who Christ is. So that is the main purpose of this video. Meanings Jesus Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua. Strong says Yeshua means he will save. Yeshua comes from Yehoshua, which means Jehovah saved. So, Jesus means he will save, or some say it means Jehovah saved or Jehovah saves. Side note, if you want to see the etymology of Jesus' name, or in other words, how it became our English Jesus, Look for the link in the description box below with the title, Etymology of Jesus' Name. Christ. Strong says this about Christ, which is a Greek word. Now, uh, Christ is um, the same thing as Christos. In Greek, they would say Christos. In English, we just say Christ. Um, in English, the OS of the Greek word at the end is cut off. Um, leaving only the Greek root. So uh, when I mention Christ, I might say Christ, I might say Christos, it's the same thing. So Strong says this about Christos, which is a Greek word, from 5548, anointed, i.e. the Messiah, an epithet of Jesus. Strong says this about the Greek word krio, uh, 5548 in the quote above, to smear or rub with oil, i.e by implication to consecrate to an office or religious service. So the reason why it says 5548 is because in Greek, in uh, Strong's Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, for each word in his dictionary, then he gave it a number. And it's important to know when he's talking about the, the numbers, when the numbers that he gives is for his Greek dictionary or for his Hebrew dictionary, because the numbers overlap. So, for example, the first word in his Hebrew dictionary has the number one. And it's the same thing with the first word in his Greek dictionary. So you have to know which uh, dictionary this is coming from. In this example, or in this case, it's from his Greek dictionary, and that word is krio. So that's Greek, but what about in Hebrew? Does Christ come from Hebrew, or is it only something found in the New Testament, which is in Greek? Christ does not come from Hebrew. In other words, Christ is not a Hebrew word. But the idea of Christ does come from Hebrew. Christ is a translation of the word Messiah from Hebrew to Greek. Strong says this about the Hebrew word Messiah. From 4886, anointed, usually a consecrated person, as a king, priest, or saint. Specifically, the Messiah. Now again, uh, in this example, because this is a definition for a Hebrew word, these numbers is uh, tells you or is connected to his Hebrew dictionary. So you wouldn't want to look up these numbers in his Greek dictionary. You'd come to a word that's completely unrelated to Messiah. So um, the only thing I want to make very clear is Christ, or Christos, means anointed, and Messiah means anointed, which is exactly why Messiah is translated as Christ uh, when it's taken from Hebrew into Greek, because they both mean the same thing. And that's the essence of what translation is about, is translating one word from one language into another word from another language that means, hopefully, exactly the same thing or something very close to it. Side note. Some say Christ is a title which has been given to one or more of the Greek gods. Whether this is true or not, it makes no difference. Christ means anointed or anointed one. 
It's a legitimate translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. A clear example of Messiah being translated as Christ in the New Testament can, found, can be found in John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. So if you want to be absolutely certain that Christ is the same thing as Messiah, that it's not a uh, pagan title, then all you have to do is look in John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, and you will see a very clear example right there. And there's actually at least one other example that I can think of, which is also in John, uh, but this should be good enough. Messiah slash Christ in Scripture. People were anointed to signify that they were, or would soon become, king. Because of this, a king could be called Messiah. So an example of a king being anointed uh, in order to become king can be found in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It says, And Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets, and said unto him, Gird up thy loins, and take this vial of oil in thy hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in, and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the vial of oil, and pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith Jehovah, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door, and flee, and tarry not. So, in this example, you can see that Elisha, the prophet, told one of the sons of the prophets to go find Jehu and anoint him. But it's not just that Elisha chose Jehu to be the king. Elisha was, uh, as we can suppose from what it says, Elisha was told by God to do this also. So just like um, the one of the sons of the prophets who Elisha called was told by Elisha to do something, um, Elisha was told by God to tell this son of the prophets to do this. And we can tell that because it says, Right here, thus saith Jehovah, I have anointed thee king over Israel. So this is coming from God. Elisha did not choose Jehu to be king. God did. And that's a very important point. And if you're wondering, when it says oil, uh, most of the time in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, possibly every single time, but I'm not exactly sure about that. When it says oil, it doesn't mean um, crude oil. It doesn't mean uh, oil that you get from... Uh, cooking fat, it means olive oil. So that is an example of a king being anointed in order to become king. Jehu was anointed uh, in order to become the king. Because of this, because kings were anointed, a king could be called Messiah. So here's an example of a king being called Messiah. Now, I'm going to read to you uh, the first verse in the psalm, and I'm going to read to you the last verse in the psalm. The first verse just shows you who is writing the psalm. That's my main point. And then the last verse is what I'm mostly talking about. For the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of Jehovah, who, spoke unto, who spake unto Jehovah the words of this song in the day that Jehovah delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I love thee, O Jehovah, my strength. So this was written, or at least thought of, it was written by David, and David also spoke uh, this psalm unto Jehovah, the words of this song, in the day that Jehovah delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, and from the hand of Saul. So this was something that was uh, thought up by David. More than likely, it was also uh, written by David. Now, the last verse in this psalm uh, says something important. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth loving kindness to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. So, first of all, this psalm is written by David. David is talking about God um, giving him, himself, deliverance. So, God gives, David is talking about God giving David deliverance. And it says, Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth loving kindness to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. So, king and anointed are both used as synonyms, and they're both referring to David. 
Now, obviously, at this time, David was, um, I guess you could say he was the king, though he wasn't acting as the king um, quite yet. Actually, I think uh, this is talking about after Saul died. So at that point, David would have been acting as the king. But he was anointed to be the king long before he actually um, ever acted as the king. But my main point is king and anointed are used as synonyms. Now, the Hebrew word that is translated here as anointed is Messiah. Because remember, Messiah is the Hebrew word. The meaning of that word is anointed or anointed one. So that is an example of a king, in this, in this uh, instance, David, being called the Messiah or a Messiah or a anointed person. So the king was anointed to become king, and the king could be called Messiah or anointed. Those who became high priest would be anointed. Because of this, the high priest could be called Messiah as well, just like the king. Now, this is an example of the high priest being anointed in order to become a high priest. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened mingled with oil, and wafers unleavened anointed with oil. Of fine wheat and flour shalt thou make them. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 7. Then shalt thou uh, then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. So, first of all, this is God speaking to Moses. It says, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. So this is God giving uh, commands to Moses, telling Moses how Moses would, um, I guess you could say, institute um, Aaron and Aaron's sons as priests. It was the ceremony that Moses was supposed to uh, put them through. Now, you might say down here, it says, Then thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. But how do we know that this is talking about the high priest? Well, in this example, then, uh, like I said, Moses is anointing or is um, instituting Aaron and uh, his sons into the office of the priest of priests they're becoming priests basically is what I'm trying to say so um, it would either be Aaron or one of his sons that's talking about it says and pour it upon his head so this is obviously singular this isn't this is just one person this isn't um, more than one so the reason why we know that it is the high priest and not any of the other priests is because it says First of all, in verse 4, it says, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tent of meeting, and shalt wash them with water. So that's uh, Aaron and his sons, all of the priests, or who are becoming priests. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And thou shalt set the mitre upon his head, and put, put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. So... First, it's talking about Aaron and his sons, and then it's talking about Aaron specifically. Now, Aaron was the first high priest under the law. So, in this example, or in this instance, when it's talking about um, taking the anointing oil and pouring it upon his head, first, because of verse 5, it is talking about Aaron specifically, and it continues to talk about him all the way through to verse 7. We know that verse 7 is talking about Aaron only. And second of all, we know that Aaron is, was the high priest. So this is specifically talking about how the high priest was, uh, or became, I should say, how the high priest became the high priest. So that's an example of the high priest being anointed. And then because the high priest was anointed, then the high priest could be called Messiah. Now, this is an example of the high priest being called Messiah or anointed. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any one shall sin unwittingly in any of the things which Jehovah hath commanded not to be done, and shall do any of them, if the anointed priest shall sin so as to bring guilt on the people, then let him offer for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, unto Jehovah for his sin offering. 
So here we have the phrase, the anointed priest. Because uh, the high priest was the only one that was anointed with oil, then when it says the anointed priest, it's referring to the high priest. And again, anointed, uh, the word is Messiah. The meaning is anointed. Therefore, um, this could also say, if you wanted to, instead of translating anointed, if you wanted to just take the word and bring it into English, instead of translating it, then it could say, if the Messiah priest shall sin. So this is an example of the high priest being called Messiah or anointed. So that is two examples uh, of the high priest being anointed and then the high priest being called anointed or Messiah. We'll get back to this topic right after this. Dinoglus.com or go-dine.com is still growing. From there, you can read one of the 8 plus topical guide articles. As the name implies, each topical guide article covers a specific topic. You can get data oriented information in the form of equations and tables from the general research section. This section will continue to grow as I try to address different topics and issues. You can create an account, post comments, and use the forums. You can, of course, look at the storefront to see what products are available for purchase. The storefront links to the products available at the Donagolus store. I invite you to come and take a look at the website for yourself. All right, let's continue. God is the king. God ruled using his judges and prophets, which is why some people call the Israelite government a theocracy. It gives a new meaning to God's phrase, my people, doesn't it? If God is the king. Now, I would like to read uh, three parts of scripture. I'm just going to read verses 5 and 6. You can read the rest for yourself if you'd like to. Verses 1 through 8. All right. It says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be mine own possession from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, this is God speaking to Moses, and Moses was supposed to tell the children of Israel uh, what God is saying. And notice that it says, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be mine own possession from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So there's this idea that if the people will obey God, then they will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's almost like God is saying, I am going to be your king. He was going to be the ruler. They were supposed to obey him. So... Now I also want to show you this, uh, Judges chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast saved us out of the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Jehovah shall rule over you. So um, Gideon was one of the judges that God sent to deliver Israel when they were in distress. 
uh, at this point in time, the Midianites were uh, threatening Israel, and Gideon, um, God used Gideon to drive them away. And so the people, because they apparently viewed Gideon as a mighty warrior, then the people uh, told Gideon, we want you to reign over us. But Gideon said, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Jehovah shall rule over you. So Gideon was acknowledging that God was the king of Israel in this example, or in this instance. Now, there is one thing that I want to point out. When uh, the men of Israel say, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, that implies... Um, that's different than when God sent judges. Like I said, God used his judge. He sent judges and prophets and, and the judges and prophets were kind of like his servants that he would send and they would um, be his arms and his mouth so that he could, so that God could rule over the people. So even though he sent judges and, and uh, prophets, God was still the king and the judges and prophets were just like his servants. But there's a difference here. When they say, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, they're talking about making Gideon their king. Because with the judges and the prophets, God would raise up a judge and raise up a prophet when he wanted to and when there was a need for them. But a lot of times, especially with the judges, if you read in Judges, the book, then there was uh, a judge would be raised up. He would save them. Because the people would sin, God would send um, people to uh, basically harm Israel because of their sins. And then they would, they would repent and say, God, we've turned away from you. Please save us. And he would have mercy on them. And then he would raise up a judge. The judge would save them, would rule over them, and then he would die. After he died, then the Israelites would again for, forsake God and go their own way. And the process kept going in cycles. So there was um, a space between one judge and the next. But here, when the people say, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, a king, when the king dies, one of his sons becomes king. And when he dies, one of his sons becomes king. So there's no space from one ruler to the next. And I think that that might be what these people wanted. They didn't want uh, for a judge to rule them and then to die, and there's no one to rule them anymore. They wanted someone, uh, a physical human being, to constantly reign over them, which is why they say this, I believe. So, anyways, this is an example of um, Gideon. Gideon acknowledges that God is the king of Israel. So, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, I believe, through 9. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto Jehovah. And Jehovah said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto, th say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not be king over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, and that they have forsaken my, forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit thou shalt protest solemnly unto them, and shalt show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Now, the reason why I believe it says, um, so do they also unto thee is because, like I said, uh, in this instance Samuel was a prophet so God is this kind of uh, verifies what I was saying that uh, the prophets and the judges were sent as like servants uh, from God to rule um, the people but God was the king um, this um, the prophets and the judges were just servants of God so they were like his hands and his feet or his mouth and his arms that kind of a thing to the people now, again, like I said before about the king, you can see the same idea that the people wanted someone, uh, they wanted a continual uh, physical human ruler over them. And they said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways, 
and now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So Samuel was old. He was going to die. And the people were seeing, okay, Samuel's going to die. We're not going to have a ruler anymore. His sons are not like him. They don't walk in, they don't walk after the ways that God has set for them. They're not, he, God is not going to use them to judge us like Samuel has. So we're going to lose our ruler. So before you die, Samuel, we want you to anoint a king so that we will still have a ruler after you're gone. And then obviously my main point is that God said here himself that they have rejected me, that I should not be king over them. So God not only uh, has Gideon acknowledged that God is the king, but here you have God specifically saying that he is the king. Now, um, the word used here when it says that I should not be king over them, uh, the Hebrew word means ruler, but it can be translated as ruler or king. It's, it's the same idea. So if you look in the King James Version, it does say ruler, but it's, it's still the same thing. It's still clear. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus was anointed by God. Jesus is, Jesus is the Christ, the King of the Jews, the King of Israel, and the King of the world. More than that, Jesus is also the High Priest, who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. So, uh, the reason why I say this specifically, Jesus was anointed by God, is because I know most of you will probably say, okay, we know that Jesus is called Christ. That's obvious. It says it many times in the New Testament. But some of you might ask, if Jesus is the Christ, which, you know, we, it does say that he is, but if he is, then when was he anointed and who anointed him? Now, I can't answer when he was anointed exactly, but I can say who anointed him. Now, it came to pass when all the people were baptized that Jesus also having been baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form as a dove upon him, and a voice came out of heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. So this verse shows that Jesus pleased God, or Jesus pleased the Father. The Father was pleased with the Son. Now, in this verse, uh, it specifically talks about being anointed, which is why I'm going to bring it up. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he entered, as his custom was, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book, and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He hath sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, Today hath the scripture been fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the words of grace which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? So, Jesus says, Today hath the scripture been fulfilled in your ears. So, Jesus is um, stating that this is referring to himself. That he has been anointed to preach good tidings to the poor. So there's um, three main things that I want to point out that Jesus is claiming by applying this verse to himself. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, which would be Jesus in this case. So Jesus has the spirit of the Lord, which is something that the prophets had and the judges had, like for example, Samson. When the spirit of the Lord uh, came upon him, then he uh, he became very strong and he could do uh, superhuman things that are literally impossible for anyone else to do. Because he anointed me, so Jesus is also claiming through this that he was anointed to preach good tidings to the poor, and he hath sent me to proclaim release to the captives. So Jesus has the spirit of the Lord. This, uh, the Lord has anointed him. Because it says, because he, in other words, the Lord, anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, and he, in other words, the Lord, hath sent me to proclaim release to the captives. So Jesus is anointed and sent and sent by God. Jesus is the Christ, the King of the Jews, the King of the world, uh, the King of Israel, and the King of the world. 
Now, I want to read this. Um, the main thing that I want to go through, though, I'm, you can look at this whole section yourself. Um, I just want to skip ahead. Now, it kind of begins here, which is why uh, I say that. Uh, I give this whole reference, chapter 8, verse 16, through chapter 9, verse 7. I'm going to skip to the end, though, because it, it carries the same thought all the way through into the next chapter. But I'm going to skip down to verses 6 and 7, I believe. 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this. Now, there's three things that I want to point out here. The first is that the child that is born in this prophecy is a king. It says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. It also says that of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. So he will have a government. He will be a king. The second is that he will reign on the throne of David essentially, not necessarily the physical throne of David, but uh, in as if a descendant of David. It says, or actually as a descendant of David, it says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth even forever. So the increase of his government, of this child, and of peace, which uh, is brought on because of his government, will not end, and this the increase of his government and of peace will be upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it. Now, another thing uh, along the same lines is it says upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So you can see that um, when it says his kingdom and when it says the throne of David, that those are being used as synonyms synonym you could say phrases i guess it's the same idea upon the throne of david and upon his kingdom same idea so what uh this prophecy is saying is that this child will be will reign on the throne of david as a descendant of david and then the third thing i want to point out is it says from henceforth even forever so the increase of this child's government and of his and of peace will be from henceforth even forever. And it also says there shall be no end. Now notice that there's two points where it, it says that his kingdom will not end. It says there shall be no end and from henceforth even forever. It's almost like God wanted to make it very clear that his kingdom would not end. Now, if we remember uh, those three points, we will notice similarities in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this might be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus is, uh, I said uh, towards the very beginning of this video, means he will save, or Jehovah saves. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. So, it says that he should be great and should be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So, Jesus, according to Gabriel, is going to reign on the throne of David. So he's going to be a king and he's going to reign on the throne of David. Those are two points that Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 mentions about the child that was was to be born. 
And it also, Gabriel also says, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's the third point that Isaiah chapter 9 uh, mentions. And I also want to point out that notice how it says uh, that his kingdom will not end twice, just like it did in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, uh, though in a little bit different way. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So it it's uh, kind of the same formula, you could say. It also says, The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now, the fact that God gives Jesus the throne is important. Just like how Elisha did not choose Jehu to be king, God did, and uh, Samuel did not choose Saul to be king, God did. And then after Saul, Samuel did not choose David to be king. God did. In the same way, Jesus, if he is going to be king, must be chosen by God. Which is why it's so important that it says, The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And then finally, uh, in this verse, then we notice it says, Of his father, David, which shows that Jesus was a descendant of David. Now it also shows up here that uh, Joseph was of the house of David. So Jesus was a descendant of David. So was Mary. Joseph and Mary were both descended from David. And we will also see that in this part. And there were shepherds in the same country abiding in the field and keeping watch by night over their flock. And an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the sign unto you, ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men in whom he is well pleased. So an angel of the Lord is talking or is announcing uh, this announcement to certain shepherds in the field, or a group of shepherds. And he says, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Now remember what Jesus' name means. It means he will save. Who is Christ the Lord? We already know what Christ means. Christ means anointed or anointed one. Lord uh, in Greek is Kyrios. Kyrios can be used for God. In fact, in the New Testament, it, it, it is used for God a lot. But in general, it just means like a king or a dignitary, or uh, even maybe a master, someone who has a high rank. Uh, I believe usually in the government, but just someone who is over most people or over everyone. So in general, it could be translated as who is the anointed king. And um, as you see right here, it says uh, in the city of David that uh, this Savior, who is Christ the Lord, is born to you this day in the city of David. Now, uh, in the very beginning of the chapter, it says that uh, there was a census going on. Everyone was supposed to go back to where uh, they originated from, basically. And because Joseph and Mary were both uh, descendants of David, then they were supposed to go to the city of David, which is Bethlehem, um, and while they were there, Mary gave birth. So the fact that he was born in the city of David because of the what was going on at that time shows that, again, that Jesus was a descendant of David. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says that this child that is going to be born would be a king, would rule over or reign over the house, uh, the, would reign on the throne of David, and his kingdom would never end. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 33, then Gabriel announces to Mary that she would have a son. He, uh, she was to name him Jesus, and that he would reign on the throne of David, and his kingdom would not end. In Luke chapter 2, verses 18 through 14, then an angel of the Lord, uh, which could also be Gabriel again, announces to a group of shepherds in a field, that uh, that same day, a Savior was born, who is Christ the Lord, or the anointed king, you could say. 
Now, uh, you can read this for yourself, John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. I'm going to skip to Revelation chapter 19. Now, this is talking about uh, Jesus when he comes back as a king to rule the nations. And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat thereon called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he hath a name written, which no one knoweth but he himself. And he is arrayed in garment... He is arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And out of his mouth proceedeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we know that this individual who is riding on a white horse is a king because it says upon his head are many diadems. A diadem is an old English word that means crown. So in Greek, what this is saying is upon his head are many crowns. So he's a king. It also says that he has a name written on his garment and on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords. So he's a king. Now, we know that this is Jesus because it says that, and his name is called the Word of God. John uh, was the uh, writer of Revelation. He was also the writer of the Gospel of John. And uh, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And uh, this was with God in the beginning. And then as you read through the chapter, then uh, he says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he reveals that the word that he's talking about is Jesus. So this is referring back to John chapter one, pretty much. And it's almost like John is expecting uh, the readers of Revelation to have already read the gospel or his gospel, his uh, his good news. So John is referring is hinting or showing us that this is Jesus. Now, there is uh, something that's actually pretty interesting about this uh, verse here. It says, Out of his mouth proceedeth a sharp sword, and that with it that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God, the Almighty. So, he's coming to smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. So, he's coming as a king in judgment. Now, if you can remember that idea, um, and we will get back to that in a second. So, again, Jesus is a king, as we've read in these verses. He is the Christ. He is the king. But not only is he a king, he's also the high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He was pure enough that he offered himself. He didn't need to offer um, the blood of animals, or specifically the blood of uh, lambs, or uh, the blood of goats, or the blood of oxen. He offered his own blood. He offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, I want to read a uh, psalm in the Old Testament. And remember that Jesus in Revelation chapter 19 is coming as a king to smite the nations and to rule them with a rod of iron. A Psalm of David. Jehovah saith unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jehovah will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people offer themselves willingly in the day of thy power, in holy array. Out of the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Jehovah hath sworn, and will not repent. Thou art, thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand will strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill the places with dead bodies. He will strike through the head in many countries. He will drink of the brook in the way. Therefore will he lift up the head. So, first of all, my main point in bringing this up. Jesus is the high priest. This is written by David. This is a psalm of David. But this is not talking about David. It says, Jehovah... This is David speaking. Jehovah saith unto my Lord. So David is not writing about himself. 
he's writing about his Lord. It says, Jehovah saith unto my Lord, in other words, David's Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Jehovah will send forth the rod of thy strength. This is Jehovah speaking to his Lord. Jehovah will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So David's Lord is a king because the rod of his strength is going to be sent forth out of Zion. In other words, he's going to reign from Zion. And, it, and he's also going to rule in the midst of his enemies. But not only is David's Lord a king, he's also a priest. It says, Jehovah hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Very interesting. And another thing that's interesting is Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Or at least he was like a priest. In Genesis, uh, I don't remember the chapter, Melchizedek was the king of Salem and he came out to meet Abraham after Abraham brought uh, all of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah back when they were captured. Abraham went after the kings that captured them and brought them back to Sodom and Gomorrah uh, along with Lot and his family. And uh, Abraham offered tithes to Melchizedek. So in that sense, Melchizedek was like a priest. And I'm not sure, I can't remember, Melchizedek maybe offered sacrifices to God. I can't remember if it says that. But Melchizedek was a king and he was also uh, a priest. And it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus is a king, but he's also a priest, the high priest. So, um... This individual, David's Lord, is a king and a priest. Now, look at this. It says, The Lord at thy right hand will strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill the places with dead bodies. He will strike through the head in many countries. He will drink of the brook in the way. Therefore will he lift up the head. This verse specifically sounds like what it's talking about in Revelation chapter 19. Jesus is coming back to judge the nations. It says that he will uh, smite them with the sword that proceeds out of his mouth, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. The Lord at thy right hand will strike through kings in the day of his wrath. So God at the right hand of uh, David's Lord will strike through kings in the day of God's wrath. That sounds like Revelation chapter 19. Now, if we were to read Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 28, uh, the writer of Hebrews attributes Psalms chapter 110, uh, the Lord of David, uh, he attributes that as being Christ, as uh, Jesus Christ, I should say. So, and we can see that there is a lot of connection to Jesus Christ in that psalm. And uh, what's interesting is, uh, like I said about um, about Melchizedek, is that just like how Jesus is both a king and a high priest, and Melchizedek is a king and a priest, I don't know if he'd be a high priest or not, but a king and a priest, but also you can see something else interesting in the term Christ or Messiah. Because Christ and Messiah both being anointed, it's very interesting how uh Christ could be used for the king, and Christ could also be used for the high priest, and Jesus is both. Very interesting. All right, summary. Jesus means he will save, and Christ and Messiah both mean anointed or anointed one. Kings and high priests were anointed with olive oil. God, or to be more precise, Hashem, Jehovah, I am, was, is the king of Israel. Jesus is the Christ prophesied about, the Christ born in Bethlehem and announced by angels, the king of the world and the final high priest. He came to earth in the first century as the high priest to sacrifice himself to pour out his own blood as an atonement for the sins of those who would uh, believe on him and turn to God. And he will come back again as the king, just like it says in Revelation chapter 19. I hope that by examining the meaning of Jesus' name and the title Christ, you have a better picture of who Jesus is. Jesus is not just a good person, a teacher of morals, a prophet, or even a magician. Jesus is the Christ. 
While this video might not prove this in itself, I hope that it's given you a better view of that fact. All right, everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you find it interesting, then why not consider subscribing to my channel and clicking the like button. That way YouTube will rank the video higher. Other people will see it. They'll watch it and hopefully enjoy it just as much as you have. Again, thank you for watching.